change of pace this afternoon, change of tone, because we're here this afternoon to talk about creative writing in education. Um, and this is where I come in, because I've been feeling a little bit overwhelmed today by all these incredibly talented writers and journalists. Um, I graduated from St Edmund Hall in 1995, um, and I became an English teacher. I'm now a senior teacher at a secondary school in Lincolnshire. Um, I also write about issues related to the teaching of English, um, mainly the teaching of English literature post-16. Um, and we heard a lot this morning about this idea of people wearing different hats and playing different roles. I think as a teacher of English literature, you're always very conscious of the fact that you are teaching students how to be critics, not how to be creative writers. Um, I know we've got a number of other English teachers in the audience here today, and I think it's probably fair to say that in today's educational climate, as English teachers, we're always very much aware um, that what we do is shaped by different educational agendas, um, not necessarily agendas that we would have chosen, and that therefore often opportunities for genuine creativity are curtailed by the need to teach to particular tests, to drill our students in ways of jumping through assessment hurdles. Um, often that means that when we find opportunities for creativity, they tend to take place outside the formal curriculum. Um, they often seem quite illicit and subversive, um, probably all the more fun because of that um, for us and for our students. Um, so that's a little bit about the picture in schools. That's my experience as a secondary school teacher of English. Beyond schools, of course, the picture is very different because the last two decades have seen this enormous expansion in the teaching of creative writing. Aspiring writers can now develop their craft right through to doctoral level. There's a whole host of workshops and courses that people can attend, both in person and online. We might think of creative writing in the traditional sense of fiction and poetry, but a quick look at the details of some current master's programmes shows that you can study a wide range of different genres, from children's writing, travel writing, right through to writing documentaries, writing radio drama, and a whole host of multimedia texts. Creative writing in education has evolved its own pedagogies and working practices. We've seen some very fruitful exchanges with other disciplines as well. But of course this hasn't been without controversy and what I'm hoping we can do in this panel this afternoon is to explore some of the issues and tensions that surround this extremely dynamic new discipline. Now we've got a fantastic range of panellists this afternoon who represent a wide range of experiences and I think it's fair to say a wide range of opinions about creative writing in education as well. So I'll introduce them very briefly. Rebecca Connell, on the end, is a novelist. She's been described as having an exceptional talent for storytelling. She teaches creative writing for an organisation called the Writers' Workshop. She's currently leading a 10-week course on how to write a novel, um, which sounds, sounds a challenge, sounds very interesting. I'm sure she'll tell us more about that later. <coughs> Rich Goodson has a doctorate in creative writing. He teaches creative writing to teenagers from refugee and migrant backgrounds. He's also the founding member of an intercultural group of writers based in Nottingham. Gabriel Giuscovici is a novelist, poet and critic, and he's also a research professor at the University of Sussex. He says that he's always held out at Sussex against creative writing programmes, but that he's all for encouraging writers, which is quite another thing. <coughs> Jenny Lewis is a poet, playwright and children's author. She led the Synergies Project here at Teddy Hall with Lucy Newland that I know quite a few of you here were involved in. She teaches creative writing in a variety of different contexts. She's led workshops in settings as diverse as the Ashmolean Museum, Kew Gardens and for the Oxford, Oxfordshire branch of Mind. And then finally, Jan Lovelock is a poet, critic and translator who's been extensively involved in the teaching of creative writing in schools and colleges and for the Workers' Education Programme, based largely in the West Midlands. He's also worked, interestingly, in the prison sector, where he co-founded the Buddhist Prison Chaplaincy Organisation. He's taught in a wide range of settings, psychiatric day centres and senior citizens' care homes as well. So a lot of different experience, different perspectives that we've got assembled here today. Now I have a number of questions that we're going to use as the starting point for our exploration of the teaching of creative writing. Um, we'll probably have some time for questions at the end. Um, in true English teacher style, I might finish by giving you a question to think about as well. <laughs> so I'd like to start just by asking our panellists if they could share a memory from their own childhood or from their own education in relation to creative writing, something that sums up something important for them about the teaching of creative writing or their journey as a writer. Maybe we could start with Rebecca. Um, 
Well, my memory is from a very early age. I think I was probably about five years old. Um, this was uh, at primary school, obviously, when one morning it was revealed to me that um, I had been chosen to read my story that I'd written the previous week out in assembly. And I must say this just sprung on me somewhat. The idea of actually airing your writing in a public forum was at that point obviously completely alien to me. I didn't really like the idea of it at all. And I have to say, it probably was a complete disaster. I, I stammered through the story. I couldn't really get my words out properly. I was talking too fast. Even worse, at one point, um, throughout the story, I referred to my grandmother as Nanny, which for some reason I found intensely embarrassing and did not want to share with the audience. So I pretended not to be able to read what I had written. It was all <laughs> it was a bit of a disaster. And um, the headmistress quickly took over and read out the story for me instead. Um, placed a particular emphasis on words that I'd use that she liked, such as the phrase hither and thither. And all in all, I found it an incredibly embarrassing experience, but I think in retrospect it did teach me two quite important things, um, which is firstly, if you want to be a writer in the professional sense, you need to accept that it isn't solitary, although the act of writing itself obviously is very much self-contained and something you do on your own. The act of being a writer, and of course of being taught writing as well, is actually quite a public business. Um, and secondly, don't write anything that you would be ashamed to read aloud, which is something that I did not try and follow to this day. That's really interesting, one that I should remind my students that sometimes they may get us to read something out in a seminar yeah. and not want to. Jan? Uh, it's, it's almost exactly the same as um, Rebecca, except I was 12, so it was even worse. <laughs> um, I didn't have to read it in assembly, but um, I'd done my homework and they said, write, write a story about such and such, scenario. so I did, with lots of graphic details, and the teacher liked the graphic details and read them out in public. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, if an authority figure, and you think about it later, if an authority figure find something impressive about something that you've done, then that, that forces you in to think that well, maybe there is something there as well. And it's a, it's a way of finding out something about yourself, because at that age, and perhaps all the way through our lives, we can't reconcile the fact that other people are different from us. They don't operate in the same way, they don't think and do the same things. So. Uh, Somebody says, okay, this is great writing, and you think, ah, it's just homework, what's, what's special? <laughs> well, we seem to be going up in sort of increments of five or six years. So, uh, I want to talk about <coughs> actually a, a reading experience rather than a writing experience, but the reading experience was very, very important for me as a writing, unlocking uh, certain things. Um, that took place, I had a year between school and university. I'd been, I got a place here at Teddy Hall and was told I was too young. I was furious, but it was a wonderful, wonderful chance to have a year to read widely and think and uh, roam around uh, London. I, I'd never lived in a capital city before. And amongst the various books that I got out of the Putney Library, and they were wonderful, that was the days when public libraries really were well stocked. Um, I'd gone through sort of the, many of the classics, and I stumbled across Proust. So I thought, well, actually, the first volume was missing, and I kept waiting, and obviously somebody was struggling with French <laughs> in the, what Beckett called the execrable NRF 13 volume edition. But it did finally come back. And uh, when I read Proust, something happened. Um, I realized that it was different from all the books I'd read before, and that suddenly they were great masterpieces. They were like great mountains standing there, which you could admire, you could uh, be moved by. But here was suddenly somebody talking about failure, talking about the inability to write, the inability to live, the wondering what he was, how he was going to uh, control his life, how he was going to organize his life. And suddenly to have somebody writing about being unable to convey, feeling moved by 
uh, a walk along the river and all he could do was bang his umbrella down on the ground and say, zoot, 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 and almost burst into tears because there was something that needed to come out that couldn't come out. He was somebody in a, you know, a massive classic, as it were, talking about things like that. Suddenly it made it possible, as it were, to fail and to accept that failure was part of what, not just what writing is, but I think what Proust makes this point about, you know, about living as well, that it's part and parcel of being human. And the whole point is how you deal with it, how you're able to just keep going. And that was an extraordinary releasing and freeing sort of moment for me, and uh, one that stood me in good stead ever since. Really interesting. Thank you. Rich? Um, I'm going to go back to being five. Um, I'm going to recite a poem for you. It's called Dinosaur. A dinosaur is very big, much bigger than a pig, and much bigger than a wig. <laughs> you cannot take one home for tea because they are too big, you see, you see. <laughs> that was my first poem. Um, <laughs> However, when, when I wrote that, when I, was, when I was five, the teacher didn't believe I'd written it. And when my mum came to collect me from school, uh, the teacher called to my mum and said, has Richard written this or did you write it for him? And I was appalled by this thought. And I decided then that I had to write another poem to prove that the first one wasn't a fluke. <laughs> And I think, actually, that continued for quite a few years. <laughs> um, maybe that's what I'm still doing. <laughs> no, I hope not. Um, my other significant memory is going on an Arvon week. Uh, the Arvon Foundation, I'm sure you know, runs these uh, creative writing weekends and weeks. I went to Totley Barton. This was in 2006. Um, and I suppose I'd been looking for um, a tribe of my own, a tribe that I trusted with criticising my writing, and I found my tribe that week. And I do, th I do think it takes a long time to find people that you trust to look at your writing, um, and people that you trust their opinion. But, but that, for me, that was significant because that week I found my tribe. Mm. That's interesting, thinking about my students and how the students who do write, there's always this very tentative stage of, well, can I show you some of my poems? And that they're not quite sure about finding that voice and that confidence to, to share their work. Mm. Thank you. Jenny? Well, I'm going to go even younger to four. And it's, it's a competition. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of picks up on... Rich's anecdote. Um, I remember I was just learning to read and write and I, I came home and I ran into the kitchen and said to my mother, there are words that are the same. There's hay and day and gay and play and stay. And, it went, <laughs> and my mother sort of looked at me in utter bemusement. But for me, it was a complete epiphany if I'd only known that word when I was four. <laughs> and because it it sort of opened up language to, as this huge, exciting thing that was there in the world and that I had connected to, and that, that connection was mine, and it was something that I had, I could own. And I think that's when you're teaching um, people, it, it's if you can just get them to get rid of all the preconceptions and all the classics they've read and just have that moment of connecting with something that really excites them, and then, then you know, they're lost yes. or they're yeah. found. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, that whole process of taking ownership of words and being yeah. able to use them and combine them in different ways yeah. that are entirely theirs. Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, now, I started off this session by talking about this huge expansion in the teaching of creative writing that we've seen over the last 20 years or so. And in fact, this September sees the introduction of the first ever A-level course in creative writing. Um, I wonder if we could talk a bit about what people think of this. Is this formal teaching of creative writing a good thing? What does creative writing gain from this? And are there any potential losses? 
Um, and I'm going to go back to Jenny, first mm. of all, for this. Well, I, I can't see that there are any losses um, in helping people to find that, well, what I just said earlier about the creativity. Connecting with your own creativity, to me, is the greatest gift and the most important thing and it also irrigates the whole intellectual process mm. it's not two th they're not two separate things yeah. they're two meshed things and I think it's very much becomes part of the cognitive pro process and development mm. of the person yeah um, and also I teach um, quite a lot of American students and they're usually way ahead mm. of British students only because they've had creative writing built into their curriculum right. Um, you know, from an early age, and so they, a, they know a huge amount more about poetry and mm -hmm. contemporary poetry and what's happening in the poetry world. They yeah. read articles about it. They read essays. They, their critical analysis is much better, mm. uh, and they're just much further on. So yeah. I, I think it's a good thing. Right, Richard, how about you? I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, you mentioned potential losses. What potential losses could there possibly be? Um, I think it's been a long time coming and I'm very, very, very excited that it's finally here because it's a necessary stopgap between Key Stage mm. 4 yes. and an English literature degree. Mm. But I would also add that it's not necessarily there for people who want to do English literature. Mm. Um, I think it's a great foundation for doing English literature. But I also think it's a great foundation for doing lots of other things. Mm. Um, if I had a student who said, that's not interesting to me, I'm not a writer, I'm a, I'm a physicist, I want to be a physicist, mm. I want to do A-level physics and A-level mm. maths, and I would say, well, why don't you do A-level creative writing as well? Because that will help you. Mm. It will it will give you the skills to be a better scientist and a, perhaps a more well-known scientist. If they're, for example, going on into academia, they need to write good yes. theses. Mm. Mm. It helps every single subject. Mm. And, as I said, the most unlikely subjects, yeah. I would think. Yeah. yeah. I guess with my, with my slightly jaded, cynical teacher hat on, I would be thinking about the assessment regime and mm. that the A-level in creative writing sounds a fantastic thing if it's assessed by teachers in schools who know the students and who know how far they've come. Mm. Um, I guess it's when we have to start thinking about students showing particular skills because that's what the examiner will want to see. <coughs> I guess that, that's where my personal worry creeps in. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, I don't know. Can I just read out what the... Um, I've got here yeah. what the assessment objectives right. of yeah. A-level creative writing are. There are four objectives... Students are tested on their ability to develop ideas through creative writing using an imaginative approach to language and the effective use of a chosen form. That form could be prose mm. fiction, non-fiction, um, poetry, script writing. Yeah. Objective two, communicate clearly in accurate, well-crafted writing with appropriate technical control. Number three, demonstrate critical awareness of personal writing processes reflecting on the relationship between ideas, aims, development, and technique. And the fourth one is responding to existing published work as a source of learning. Mm. So it's a very yeah. rigorous mm. A-level. Yes. Uh, yeah. Probably a lot more rig rigorous than a lot of people are expecting. Yes, yeah. And it demands a lot of skills. Yeah, I think so. And a lot from teachers as well as from A lot students. from teachers, but yeah. those teachers are going to be yes. trained. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> Gabriel, if I could bring you in here. Uh, I think I've been asked here <laughs> to provide a sort of dissenting voice so that you won't sit back too much and <laughs> everyone say that they couldn't agree more. Uh, and we've heard from a couple of the previous speakers that um, they couldn't see any reason whatever why <laughs> this shouldn't be taught. Well, I, I can think of several. Um, <laughs> and I'll just give you one. Uh, in a way, it's been touched upon uh, in that first round, as it were, of answers in uh, Carol's point about... Um, 
the fact that writing at a certain point was illicit and subversive. Um, and then somebody else uh, said that um, you know you felt that there was a, a tribe, you, a rich, I think a tribe mm. you could trust. And my worry with teaching creative writing in a class is sort of twofold. First of all, that you what should be a relationship of, of trust between, you know, you show it to somebody you have come to trust and somebody you come to know. It turns it into a, uh, another, you know, course with all the tensions and all the, the peculiar ambiguities that go on in relations between the teacher who's going to assess and students who are going to be assessed. But more important than that, it seems to me, of course there was once a time when there were what he has called singing schools, um, when there were bards who were trained. And even up to the 18th century, you can think that 18th century writers read their Pope and learned from it. But you know, what the romantics felt was that there was something cardboard about that. There was something false that what they needed to do was somehow to speak for that which had no voice to give voice to the uh, repressed, to women, uh, uh, classes that had never been given the chance to speak. And if 19th century and 20th century literature was anything, it was going to be about this revolt, if you like, of the child against the father. And what are we doing here? What we are doing is actually turning this back. We adults are saying, Yes, you children, come along and we are going to tell you how it is. And the worst aspect of it is that the children are actually wanting this. I think that Wordsworth and Shelley, Rimbaud and Brecht would have turned in their graves. <laughs> Can I just, um, could I just come in and say, you talk about um, allowing voice to the repressed. I can't see... A better way. I mean, I can't see a better way of allowing people, uh, children, who come from homes without books, who um, are women, girls, um, a chance to connect with creativity than th at school, especially if their homes don't no, don't encourage it. Um, and also, how about showing a class Adrian Rich's some of Adrian Rich's work? You know, and giving people um, suddenly the knowledge these things can be spoken about and I mm. can speak about them. Mm. One point that you made that I do agree with is the quality of the teaching. Mm. And maybe, mm. going back, maybe that is something that needs to be, that needs to be worried about even. Because if you get heavy-handed, um, not very good creative writing tutors, you're mm. more likely to squash any <coughs> creativity. <coughs> So, you know, yeah. that, that's what Absolutely. I would say about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I guess probably, you know, all the more so for creative writing tutors to be aware of their own, their own not necessarily shortcomings, but the difficulties of giving feedback to a student um, who um, may be better than you. Be aware mm. of sub subjectivity yes. and how Absolutely. subjective yeah. each person's yes. re response is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably a good time to, to go on to... Um, a question about feedback um, because of Jenny and Rebecca are both involved in and Richard to some extent involved in teaching people who are seeking wider audiences um, and therefore this question of feedback yeah. um, becomes all the more important doesn't it mm. um, what sorts of problems and tensions are involved in giving people feedback on their writing Rebecca um, well I think one problem is that I find that people are almost too receptive to feedback a lot mm. of the time because <clears throat> A lot of the students that I have are, are seeking publication. Yeah. That is their ultimate goal. And I think certainly when it comes to judging their work's publishability, if you like, um, a lot of people view publishing as a very mysterious business. You know, they, they, they don't understand quite how it works and they assume that if you're published, you somehow hold the key to it and you can kind of make it fit for them. When in reality, a lot of it is in the lap of the gods and no one really understands why certain books take off and others don't. So... But I find that with my students, they're very hungry to know, you know how their work fits, how marketable it is, where it sits genre-wise. And I have to be very careful of what I say, because I find that 
obviously, with, even with teaching, there's an inevitable degree of subjectivity in, in your response that you cannot avoid that. Yeah. So I feel there's a lot of pressure on me sometimes as a teacher not to take people in the direction that, you know, that I feel might be right, but which nevertheless they might not <coughs> actually, yeah. they should not follow. And I think that, I mean, obviously, when it comes to specific feedback, I mean, personally, I always aim for tactfulness because you, you have, had the old, have had the old person who, who is bullish and who fights back and who just disagrees with everything I say. And in a way, I think, fair enough, you know, if, that's, if they don't agree with me, I, I'm not going to force them into the mould that I want them to be in. But um, personally, I know some people are very direct and confrontational when it comes to giving feedback. Yeah. It doesn't really work for me. I, I find that, you know, if you kind of frame it in, in as nice and polite a way as possible, people do tend to kind of be more receptive. Mm. And I find that when it comes to issues of, of language or character development or, or even plot, I don't get a lot of fight back from the students. I think one issue where I do find that people are quite resistant to feedback is on the question of pace, because that in a novel in particular, which is obviously quite a, a large beast, um, it's, it's really it's a nebulous question, like the idea of how a novel's pace unfolds and the highs and lows and how that mm. should be, the rhythm of the novel, if you like. And people find it quite hard to catch on to and, and, to, and to understand. So when I'm trying to give advice about that, I think in particular the resistance is over. A lot of people include large chunks of backstory or information that they want to dump on the reader. Mm. Um, and a lot of the time I'm saying, slash it out, slash it out. And a lot of people don't trust their readers. They say, but you, they need that. They need to know about <coughs> this character's childhood. Otherwise, they won't get why he's behaving in this way. Yeah. And it's quite hard, I think, mm. sometimes to get people to, to trust their readers more and to understand that actually, if they give enough cues in the present day or if they make sure that their plot you know, has, has an inner logic to it, people are going to understand that anyway. But I guess, I guess the last one I would make about it is that I find with feedback, direct questions are often the hardest to answer. Oh, you know, sometimes people just yeah. open up their work and say, what do you think? And that's okay. quite easy in a sense. You, know, you can pick and choose what mm. you like to comment on. <coughs> but one question I get asked an awful lot is, is it good enough to be published? And that's a very, very difficult question mm. to answer because, yes. well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but it's a difficult question for anyone to answer. Um, and it kind of reminds me of what we talked about at school in Latin about questions expecting the answer yes. You know, it's clear that whenever anyone asks that, they want to be reaffirmed and they want to be told yes, yes it is. Mm. When a lot of the time, my gut feeling, to be honest, is, is no. Um, but what you have to do, obviously, is realise that you're not the ultimate arbiter. And really, my only response to that is to say, look, before you even think about that, you need to make sure the novel is as good as it could possibly be. Yes. And that tends to bog us down for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you move on, <laughs> the question is often be forgotten in the first place. So, so do you think of your, <coughs> yourself as simply teaching people how to earn their living? I wouldn't like to put it like that because it does make it sound very clinical and, and very businesslike. Um, but that said, I can't ignore the fact that that's what a lot of these people are coming to me for. They want to earn a living from writing. I try and strip it back a level from that because I feel that, for a start, trying to get someone to earn a living from writing is, is so difficult. You know, it almost feels like an impossible task. Um, and really, I suppose I would hope that anyone who enrolled on the creative writing course would have a basic love of writing for its own sake. And that's what I try to encourage. Don't you think there's a contradiction then between... That is. It were something which might be very good, but you would know that it was not publishable yeah. in today's yes. yeah. exactly. world, etc. Exactly. Yeah. So, I think it is a, a really awkward contradiction that a lot of writers struggle with. and even It doesn't even have to be as extreme as that. You know, for instance, there are plenty of writers of literary fiction who you know, could be published and who you know, can find a reasonable readership, but they're never going to be mass market sellers. You know, in general, as a genre, literary fiction is not a big seller. And I'm not going to take a writer and leave them away from their natural inclination and say, well, if you want to sell and if you want to make a business, you need to write the Da Vinci Code. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, that's not what it's about. But I think what it is, is, is balancing that. You need, I think with each individual student, you need to get to the heart of what they want. You know, do they want to be a writer in the purest sense? Or do they want to make a living? And those two things aren't always compatible. I think sometimes <laughs> you, um, yeah. you need to kind of uh, put your finger on what actually matters yeah. to people and, and act accordingly. I don't mm. feel that it's my place to, to make that decision for them. Mm. And it may be, I guess, that what they do in order to make their living is a very different kind of writing. Mm. Well, exactly. I mean, I think what we're seeing more and more with, with certainly a lot of the writers that I know is that they've got various strings yeah. to their bow, and obviously mm. I do it myself. You know, 
with my writing, I, I kind of always hoped oh, I could just be a novelist and, and that would be it. But it doesn't work like that in, in the reality. The reality is that I maybe could have done that for a couple of years, but then the next year it would have gone quiet. And you, know, you need to balance it. And as a result, there's teaching, there's various things that you can do to supplement. And I'm always trying to instill that mindset in my students as well, that you know, even if they do you know, become published or yes. whatever it is they want to do, it's not game over. Yeah. 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 I think that's one of the jobs that a creative writing teacher should yeah. do. He should mm. write at the start. Disillusion, perhaps, a lot of yeah. students from their, <laughs> their golden goals of becoming a published writer. Yeah. Because, as you've said already, and as we all know, it is a lottery. Mm. The people who shine in a creative writing course might not necessarily be the ones who get published. Mm. The ones that, in a course who don't seem to be at the same level they might be the ones who are successful and as I was saying we should be giving them lots of other pathways lots of other career mm -hmm. pathways mm -hmm. we should be telling them that creative writing is enabling them to be well in terms of jobs lots of different things mm -hmm. journalists teachers social workers, community workers, politicians, whatever. But in a wider, yeah. less tangible sense, those alumni from creative writing courses are going to be custodians of culture, mm -hmm. custodians of literature and literacy and thought. Mm -hmm. And I really mean that. I know that's idealistic, but I really, really do believe that. Yeah. Because I bring this down to um, the other day. <laughs> um, a lot of the people that I've worked for haven't had illusions. They are terminally disillusioned. Mm. So when you're, um, what you're doing with them is, um, I don't want to say therapy because therapy is um, a word that's just cho um, chosen to do down what you're doing. You've got, you've got people who have a damaged self-image. Now, what, another of my jobs was to teach meditation, Buddhist meditation. And in Buddhism, the whole thing is, you know, people are ego-trippers, you, you have to cut away the self. These people are so badly damaged that you've got to build up confidence before you even uh, come along and say, ha-ha, now get rid of it. Uh, so... The feedback here, um, most of them don't believe that they're going to be um, great writers. The mere fact that one or two of these things do get into print, and I've been responsible for that every now and then, and it's changed these people. You can see the light shining out of their face. They never thought that this would happen to them, but they would do something of worth. At the same time, you are teaching and writing skills, which is going to be useful, as everybody's been saying, um, in, a, in a lot of other places as well. I had somebody, uh, she was an oldish lady, about 65, 70, and she said, right up front, all I want to do is write more interesting letters. And I thought that was a really good ambition. <laughs> so, when you're feeling that to them, obviously you're going to find what they've done well, and praise that. Then you can say, but don't you think? <clears throat> but the last thing you should do is dispel illusions that they don't have. <laughs> 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 yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Jan's picked up really nicely there on the, the point that Jenny made earlier about giving, giving a voice to people who may not previously have thought that they had the chance to speak, that they had anything to say, or anyone who would listen to them. 